Okay, uh, first of all, welcome to the first beer meetup of uh, 2017. It's, uh, it's great to see all the faces here. A lot of familiar faces, a lot of people that, that has presented before. Um, we would like to get into things very quickly. Uh, we've got a full lineup. Very excited about the, the lineup here. Um, I'll quickly go again through the agenda and then introduce people there. Um, so, just quickly in terms of what we have today, we've got most of the presenters here. Uh, there's actually the last presentation is from Rockefeller. He's actually in Cameroon, and he used to be part of Ames doing things there. So, I'm just hoping that the audio will work. Um, we've got another guy on here, Paul Saunders. Um, he co-founded the Data Science Academy also with me and he's currently based in Joburg and he's also starting a VIA chapter in Joburg, Joburg, Victoria. So we've got, we've got that on Meetup as well. So expect a bit more uh, on that front as well. And I think that's probably it. Um, so in terms of the agenda, um, what I would like to do, I've got a few slides where I just want to quickly talk about VIA, where we are and what, what's happening. Um, I also want to introduce you to Paul. I'll put him on the screen so you can say hello at least. Um, and then we basically today is all about the rest of the presentations. Um, the first presentation is, is that profit. And we don't have Mike. Mike is unfortunately sick here, but Franz is here. He's the CEO of uh, that profit. And we've got two of his data scientists here and they're planning some interesting things around emotion recognition. We look forward to that. Um, and then we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Eddie Grant. Um, and Eddie, where are you? There we go. There we go. There she is. Um, really looking forward to that as well. And the interesting thing, her husband, Charles, well, he presented uh, a, a few months ago when we were up at Barclays Rise. And the next presentation is actually Millie Hilger and, and her husband presented as well, too, sir, presented as well. So, ironically, we've got their wives presenting today. And I think we've got, well, most female presenters or presentations of, uh, uh, that we had before, so this is, this is really good. Um, and the ironic thing, both are pregnant as well. <laughs> So uh, anyway, looking forward to that, that, those two presentations. And then we've got uh, Professor Catherine Chris here as well, and she's got uh, a bunch of the students here. We've got that, and there's, there's some representation here from the Center of High Performance Computing. Um, I'm very excited to hear about their uh, presentation as well. And then we've got uh, Rockefeller, um, he's in based in Cameroon. Um, I think you can hear us, and uh, so we'll see how well that works. But uh, you'll, you'll join the, you do the last bit. So we're trying to break it down to 15 minutes each, more or less. I think maybe the first one's 20 minutes. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Sponsors is Portage Logic and City. So uh, thanks to, to, to both Portage Logic and, and City. Uh, yeah, so just quickly for people, I know there's a few people that's new to Mia, that's, I've just seen so many people just joining Mia the last week or two, and I think it's probably based on the agenda that we've got today as well, we've got some really exciting speakers. Um, and so this is just talking about some of the partners, we've, we started working with Data Science Nigeria as well, um, I've got center of HPC up there as well. But this is just some indications of, uh, of some of the, the uh, companies, organizations that we are working with. Um, and this is just growing. And this is uh, really a pull for data science and machine intelligence, which is exciting. Um, so what you will see, if you go to the MIA website, you will see um, quite a bit of detail about events and stuff. But the one thing that we really want to try and pick up 2017 to some projects, research, technology, application projects. And the interesting thing is we, we got actually quite, quite a bit of interest from corporate, so like Barclays and some of the other companies, that were asking about can they actually put projects and sponsor projects here as well. So um, we've got, we've seen this with some projects, but this could be a vehicle to actually um, do some of these projects as well. Then I would love to, I don't know who's on Slack, uh, on, on VR Slack. So we've got, there's a Slack channel, um, or Slack available for VR. 
that give you the opportunity to talk to people and start things there. And it's remember this is a community thing. We are an innovative community um, that's focused on data science research and, and, and applications around data science and artificial intelligence. So if you want to talk to people about certain subjects, you're welcome to use that. That platform is for you, it's for us. So most welcome to do that. Um, but even blogging and sharing, if you want to blog, you're most welcome to blog uh, as well. Um, okay, so let me, without further ado, go to the next one. This is just showing a little bit of history. There's on the events page, you go to machineintelligenceafrica.org, you go to the events page, you will see um, the, pretty much the, the growth path and activities that we've had. We, we pretty much started, although it was founded in 2015, we started in April 2016, really, and, and started to collaborate and share, and we had some meetups. Our first meetup was at Jumo. Uh, we've got actually some Jumo representatives here. Um, and, um, and it just grew from there. So here is a bunch of presentations to Barclays Rice, their wealth, their, their executive teams. Uh, but all the stuff in orange and stuff that's specific events and things that we need together. Um, so just to give you some sort of idea of, of what's going on, at least from an event perspective. But I think the interesting thing here is, on that page, we also make all the presentations, the videos, all of that kind of stuff available. So if you've missed something, and even some of the things that I've presented to Barclays Rise Executive Management with some specific stuff on artificial intelligence, robot advisors, all of those kind of stuff, um, that we most welcome to just download it and utilize it, so it's there. Um, so, most welcome to do that. And, yeah, so, there was one thing I wanted to say. And there's quite a bit of plans for 2017. Um, I've already mentioned the, uh, the chapter, uh, VIA chapter in Joburg, Victoria, and I'm almost done, so I just want to quickly show Paul Saunders' face and let's see if we can hear it as well. Um, but we've got, we've, we've planned also the Data Science Academy, and I think in collaboration with that profit, we're looking at combining efforts on, on that front, so that's something that's we're exploring and working on. Um, but with Stanwash University, there's a hardware for your manager project, and we want to get international students in here as well. Um, so that's going to be interesting. There's more information also on the website about that. Okay, I think uh, let's quickly go to um, Paul. Oh, there we go. This is Rockefeller. Rockefeller, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great, thanks. This is, your audio is working. Uh, okay. Yeah. You, you're actually in Cameroon. Yeah, of course. Uh, and that's why you've got the green wall behind you. <laughs> the favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're looking forward to your uh, presentation. Um, and uh, thank you, welcome. Um, awesome. I'm just going to quickly jump to Paul. Hi, Paul. How's it going in Joburg? <laughs> Good, great stuff. Uh, do you want to maybe quickly, just quickly introduce yourself and just talk about what, what you're doing there? And maybe, maybe refer also to the Data Science Academy. Sure, sure. Um, thanks. So as, uh, so as Rob mentioned, um, myself and, and himself have started at the Data Science Academy uh, with a view of uh, training corporates uh, and their teams in, in the field of data science. Um, and I moved back to Germany probably about two months ago now. Um, I was previously based in Cape Town. And um, yeah, so I've been, I've been a member of the VIA community for about six months now. And uh, you know, John and I have been toying with the idea of, of starting a chapter up in Germany. And we've, we've seen that membership increase dramatically over the last year. And we feel the time is now right. Uh, it's actually right, Germany and Victoria are here for the taking. So, uh, we feel it's a good opportunity now to actually start, to start a, a, a chat up here for, for the benefit of, of people that are interested in machine learning. Um, so, you know, the format will follow very similar to what, what is happening down in Cape Town. Uh, we'll be discussing latest trends in machine intelligence. Uh, we will be asking our community of members to come present on topics and projects that are of interest to them. And, um, 
Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody's aware that you know, the, the meetup is only really as successful as the contribution of its membership. So um, I'll be reaching out shortly to all our Joburg members um, to, to, to introduce myself and, and get in contact with them. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'm sure, John, maybe if you could just uh, you know, get my email address at the end there, and uh, I'll also be contact people on the Slack channel as well, so I'll be very active on that. Great, right. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Okay, so I think without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into the presentation. So the first one is Data Profit, and uh, do you want to click it set up? So uh, just unplug it. So you can read the audio. Um, so I'm Franz Cronier. Um, I come from a company called Data Profit, a machine learning lab based on big points to switch on. That's right. I think I've got that. No, 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 it's fine. Okay. okay, cool. Um, we, we need it for the video. Ah, right. Okay, cool. cool. Okay, anyway, as I was saying, so we're a machine learning lab based on a green point. We're going to do a mix of things. We've got a set of products around uh, customer de-aggregation, and we do a lot of bespoke work um, in the predictive environments, so you all know kind of credit scoring, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, from time to time, uh, we get these very cool projects which sits on a more bleeding edge machine learning uh, space, right? Um, so things like computer vision, natural language processing, um, applying that to the real world, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we were commissioned by an international games company to um, uh, include emotion recognition in their games, right? Um, they want to improve emotion. They want to have their games react according to the emotion that the players play, are feeling, and they want to explore this area, right? Um, we were roped in by an American kind of intermediary um, and eventually turned over to this Japanese games uh, producer. We've just actually successfully uh, finished the technical evaluation of these algorithms. We're going into kind of full scale development upon these and actually uh, have the challenge of making these now work on mobile, which is quite a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the guys that did the work, right? Uh, which probably wasn't me. <laughs> um, so we've got Gillard um, and we've got Graham. And they were kind of two key members of this project. Uh, okay, so just in case you haven't seen this before, these tend to be in motion, right? And um, <laughs> so it's, it's not far from the scene. So right here we have what are seen as the seven uh, base emotions. This was discovered by Paul Eckert in the 19th something. And uh, essentially, it's a classification problem. If we can take any image of someone's face, we can then predict just one of seven outcomes. So let's go through the basics of how we go about that. Um, I'm not going to go too much in detail. I will skip over it very quickly, just because I imagine this is the sort of crowd that knows more about computational networks. So the whole basic idea is that we go from essentially pixels in the far left, and we're going to build up our features. Um, and we don't want to do this by hand, we'll rather get the machine learning to explore us. So the very next layer of computational layer, we'll go to, to what computational layers are. Um, we'll produce more interesting features such as lines. Following from there, we can get more and more abstract features such as individual object parts and shapes. And from there, we can get even more abstract features such as faces, and in particular, in this case, uh, emotions on people's faces. And so, very basic, let's run through this quick. So neural networks are, what is that? It's essentially just a weighted sum of inputs. So the number of persons, legs, their weight, their height, and each time they have different weights, W1, W2, etc. Uh, w squared, so that's also a very good way. And from there you just really find a nonlinear transform at the very end. So it could be anything really, in theory it doesn't really matter. But it turns out that rectified linear functions, which is just that straight line over there, that tends to be the most um, effective in computational networks. So let's run through MLP. So why would you use an MLP in the first place? An MLP is just a more advanced neural network. Uh, a single, single neuron can only perform a single very basic computation. So if you're going to try and distinguish between very complex classes, you haven't really got much maneuverability in terms of 
creating more complex features. And NLP will allow you to go through several stages. So if you look at, say, this layer over there, the very top neuron is connected to all the inputs, and it'll compute its own power. Similar to the same neuron below. But then what you can do with all the inputs of those neurons is then feed them into the next layer, and so on and so forth, to create more and more interesting uh, features, which you can then eventually do your classification on at the end. So, um, you have noticed that the number of weights there does scale quite ludicrously with the number of neurons, and that's largely because they're connected to every single input neuron. So in an image, it would be connected to every single pixel. So how do you go about this? Okay. It does go there. Um, so how do we go about this? Is what we do is we use uh, weight sharing. So every single neuron in the hidden layer will instead use the exact same weights to connect to the neurons below weight sharing. But it's also um, it looks at local receptive fields. So this is an example of how convolution would work. The green layer over there is the second uh, layer of neurons. So the very top left corner you see plus 12. And what it's made of is only the bottom nine pixels just below in the blue. And what it does is it applies the weights, which you can't see, it is quite small. It's 0, 1, 2, 2, 2, 0, 0, 1, 2. And those weights will apply to just that local field to then produce the output of 12. Of course, you then need to involve for the very next neuron below. So it'll apply the exact same weights, 0, 1, 2, 2, 2, 0, 0, 1, 2, and you get the following neuron. And again, you build a whole new layer. And from there, you can apply many different um, uh, features, sorry, not features, uh, kernels, so different weights to reduce many different layer maps. And each of those green maps you then map on top of each other and apply the next layer again to produce another super image with several different colors. Um, okay, that brings us quickly to pooling. So pooling is nothing more than essentially subsampling the image, just because again we want to reduce the number of weights. Uh, so we have one far, far smaller models, and of course they train much better. Um, and so this is a simple example of pooling. We take a region of two by two pixels, and here we just take the average. Uh, there are other techniques you can use, but in short, it's just taking a larger image into a smaller one. Okay, so that brings us to our data set. We use the FR, FER 2013 uh, data set, which is actually a Kaggle competition they had on exactly this problem. Uh, and what you can see here is the Titles just below, so fear, surprise, sadness, and anger. Uh, this was labeled by Kaggle, and Microsoft then adjusted the, this very same data set to make it a bit more real. But you notice some of them aren't quite so easily interpreted. So, surprise, number two, can stop there. It's probably easier to see as happiness, but again, you can kind of see that it is a bit variable. If people interpret emotions differently. I really shouldn't have to say that. Um, and so, from here, we have to include that in the model itself. So we have a huge data set of about 22,000 images, just to learn it here, plus combined with several other data sets to get about 40,000 or so. And with this alone, we can then map our compositional neural net. Okay, but that was compositional nets. So you've probably seen that before. Let's get to something a bit more interesting. Uh, so when it comes to image recognition, obviously it's not so clear to tell the computer how to recognize the many infinite different configurations of a pixel, uh, of the several thousand pixels that contribute that exhibit a single example. So for instance, the illumination can change, the variation of the uh, view, the, the scale, the elevation, the occlusion, etc. Uh, and all of these we easily recognize as being the exact same object, and yet in, for a computer it's not exactly so easy. So one way to exaggerate this data set to make it bigger to account for all the other possible variations is to then we do do a data augmentation. So on the fly, as the training is running, we would then introduce um, permutations to the images. So we could rotate the faces just so that they're slightly angled. So the computer doesn't expect to see a face always perfectly flat out. Some people pull their head, for instance. Uh, we'll shift the image, just take a crop and a different side. Uh, we can do uh, stretches. So almost as if you grab the top and the bottom of the image and pull it to either side. And you can add galaxy of noise, change the levels of lighting. And that's one way of making your model a lot more robust and exaggerating the amount, the effective amount of data that you really have. But of course, there's many different models that you can do. Compositional neural nets are spanned out there, a lot more interesting. Um, so what you see on the right-hand side is an example of transfer learning. 
So the nice thing about the Creative Open Source community, Google, and Facebook, is they've created uh, really effective models for things like face recognition and object detection. Um, and so if we could just use those models, it would really help our data sets. Because we haven't got anything as large as they do. They have millions of images, for instance, on just faces alone. So what we can do is we can take their convolutional neural network, and all we can do is just cut the very top of it. And so we use their uh, network to essentially generate advanced uh, features. And with those, a lot of you say, listen, we're not interested in classifying if it's this kind of dog or a cat or a table. But these features are very helpful for describing natural images. And so we can then use that to then classify the person's face, as it can't be sad, et cetera. Um, we did try that, but it turns out that that wasn't as effective as other means. Um, what tended to be pretty good is actually the Google Inception network over there. So if you look on the far left, that is the picture of the graph. It's pretty ugly, but the concept is based in that whole image over there. So usually in convolutions, you decide on the window that you're going to convolve over three by three pixels, and you shuffle it across, or you shuffle it across five by five. Um, and each of those is sensitive to a different scale. But what Google uh, in the inception network, it essentially takes the best of all four worlds and says we're going to look at individual pixels. We're going to look at the local neighborhood of the 3 by 3 area, the 5 by 5 And on the all of those, we're going to stack those images and then do the exact same thing on top. That's a single inception module. And that alone turns out to be incredibly effective. Um, but of course, that's great, but we can do this on a computer. How do we get this? into your device. And with that, I'm bringing in Graham. Uh, he's going to model for us. I'm going to show you a demo just now. But, uh, so, as Franz mentioned, this was for uh, an overseas company that we had to produce this technical evaluation. Uh, one of the challenges then is how do we package this demo. And we decided to do something which we thought was quite cool instead of shipping them code or app or something we decided to do, like host it in a web service. So basically just through a web page that would go on, stream live video and consult to our server where we had model running, classified, return basically the motion to to the web page and it updates and shows you what you're feeling. So uh, basically how we did it is, Franz also failed to mention that this was done under quite a, a short time constraint. So we, we only had about two or three weeks to wrap this whole thing, thing together. So uh, the back end, everything, all the modeling that we do is in Python, so it made sense that it's hosted everything in Python. So I don't know if you're familiar with Python, but there's a, a Flask, which is a, basically a web, web API. So everything's through Flask. Essentially what we did is broke up the video clip into 500 millisecond snaps from, so record it client side and then upload that blob to the web server, which would then take it. Uh, that's probably the next slide. Uh, okay, cool. So 500 millisecond blobs of video clip get uploaded in this loop. So it's basically just an infinite loop on the client side that's recording and then uploading this video. Server's then taking it and returning it. There's a mention there of the server being uh, an easy to see it. So that's a Computer that's like a compute optimized EC2 instance. I don't know who's familiar with EC2 instances, but we basically found out that uh, for this case, so 500 millisecond clip is at 24 frames per second, roughly 12 frames, give or take, because it's not exactly client side. Um, the server we found that in small batches of images, it was faster to process them or predict using the CPU instead of the GPU. Just because of the nature, we're not trying to train the model, obviously that's been done already, so we use the GPU to train the model. Now we're just using CPU because the time required to kick it off, get a result back, was quicker with small batches, but very quickly. So that's why that's CPU in case you were wondering. Uh, essentially, I've spoken about this final reason clip comes in, we extract individual frames from that, then do face detection, so we use some things like OpenCV and other things to faces. Those faces then get run through in a batch to that TensorFlow model. Um, we do an averaging on those frames just so you know for 500 millisecond blocks what the what the expected motion is over say, those 12 frames in the classified. And then that gets returned to the client side for display. 
through message and stuff like that web, web page. Which, to have a demo, this is just an example in France here. Uh, so you can pull this off the website when, you, when you're done, you can just get basically the bins, the emotional, the emotional states in those images that are classified under each, each of those. But I'll, I'll show you this in real time. So, and that also just comes down to like the design decision is that we 
we want full control, like that full 5 by 9 you might be able to get it, but then we also, don't forget, this, we need to port this now to, to mobile, so just to have that full, that full service that we've written helps us a lot, as opposed to just pushing a model to an endpoint for the same service. And is the integration from an EC2 instance quite easy um, to, to TensorFlow? Um, is it as simple as just installing the Python library and it interacts quite well, or were you yes, no, like quite to this? So it's like so it's like any like open source Linux machine, I guess you, you're gonna have a little bit of a fight. I, I don't think anyone's installed TensorFlow like just to <laughs> like, open and click it, and then OpenCV also is another another requirement. But no, like I mean, it's just like working on any other computer. Good. And yeah, so just the, the point on that was quite interesting is that that instance actually started out. So on Amazon, you can just swap between instance like what your instance is. So it started out being a GPU instance train the model and then swap it over to CPU to, to serve it. Great. Any more questions? Great. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Cool. data science and machine learning approaches. Um, but as I was preparing that, I thought actually it might be more interesting to look at a specific example from, um, from my work right now about how data science um, can actually come together with um, other areas of science that, that are more rooted in traditional statistical approaches um, 
just to, I guess, promote awareness of those other areas that can be useful um, in data science applications. So that's sort of what my talk is going to be about. And um, having moved from neuroscience, which is um, sort of the behavioral science range, into applied statistics, I have focused on network statistics. Can I just start that? No, Oh, okay, so I'll scroll through. Okay. You've given me a minute. <laughs> um, I can scroll through you. No, no, I can scroll through okay. <laughs> I was just checking. Um, so, so you, you want to scroll through this? Yeah. You, 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 you just scroll under. Okay, I just wanted to show you the image. Oh, okay, so, gotcha. <coughs> You, you can actually just quick like a side of here if you just take full screen and then you can yeah. Well, that's right. You don't have to scroll. Yeah, so Thank you, Jasper. Yeah. 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 So, um, in policy analysis and in neuroscience, um, big data, you know, well, big data is a fairly recent thing, right? So, historically, we've worked with fairly small data sets, and that meant a lot of uh, consideration of assumptions, um, sampling, experimental design, um, thinking about, and um, there's a ton of work, and it's still ongoing in statistics, obviously, around causality and measuring causal effects. Um, and issues around limited sample sizes. So that's sort of the background that I've come from. A lot of the work that I've done has been dealing with those types of issues. Um, and then intersecting with data science, the issues become very different. They're very different issues in that intersection. So I'm going to talk about how the strengths of the two kind of come together, but more from the perspective, not so much talking about the strengths of data science and machine learning, because I assume that's what you're all more familiar with. Um, so we're more talking about what uh, behavior science and network science can add. Um, and just to sort of put it in a context, or at least how I see it, I know there's a ton written about this, um, and there's a ton that could be said about it, um, but about uh, differences in how, I don't know what to call it, except traditional statistics. Um. <laughs> I think it might be from Cameroon. <laughs> Go for it. I'll just put it on me. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, so to just have a kind of overview of it, I think um, one of the differences, obviously, is, is the theory and the role of theory in an analysis. Um, <laughs> So if, if you have a big data set, for example, um, say on crime, predicting crime is a, is, was one of the early applications of sort of machine learning and social policy, it was with these large um, data sets of recidivism to predict who's going to uh, re-offend. Um, <laughs> um, a machine learning approach could be very atheoretical um, and just use the measures that you have, whereas Traditionally, we would have surveys and a lot of theory around the behaviors and the context and the variables, what would be measured. And part of that is the cost of data collection um, and then also different disciplinary traditions. So the role of theory definitely distinguishes, um, is, is very different in the use of data science. Um, and then also levels of analysis, which is something that I'm going to focus on more because I think you're probably aware already of the theory issue. But more, um, yeah, that levels of analysis in social applications. So in applications of data science to social problems and development issues, um, attend attending to levels of analysis, which involves 
which requires some involvement with underlying theory. Another one is um, the emphasis on causal attribution versus just predictive analytics. So, um, well, not just, I don't mean that. <laughs> um, and sometimes I've heard that posed as like a, um, as though they're contradictory paradigms, like the experimental paradigm, the counterfactual model, as though that um, somehow is uh, not compatible with a predictive approach. Um, and especially, I've heard it written like as a contrasting approach with Bayesian approaches, and I don't think that's true. Um, I, but I think that they just focus on different questions and kind of have different roles. Um, and but it is a difference in the approach um, that with small data sets and sort of uh, evaluation approaches, um, the tendency is to have a lot of attention to experimental design and, and counterfactuals and causal analysis, whereas with big data, um, you can use more longitudinal correlations to predict the outcomes. Um, but some of the um, advantages of a uh, small data approach, I don't know what to call it really, statistics approach, um, would be that when we're dealing with complex systems, which social systems are, um, we know that they can have abrupt state changes. Um, and if we're working with um, predictive models that don't attend to the causal mechanisms, and we're not concerned with causal effects, um, when there's a system state change, we won't be able to predict anything until we have more data again to rerun our models and we redo our predictions. Um, so that's one of the sort of, from a statistical perspective, contributions that we made from the more traditional mechanism approach, um, which has to do with, yeah, the, those time lags. Um, and then also intervention costs. So if it's very costly to set up your intervention, um, then you might want to have more sort of a mechanistic or theory-based approach because um, Whereas if it's cheap, so, so in marketing, for example, if you're just wanting to do A-B testing, that can be very quick and, and low cost. So that can, um, you might not be as concerned with them, with having that sort of whole mechanism and theory-based approach to the problem. Um, and then finally, there are sampling issues, which actually because it's quite a short topic, I won't go into too much, but um, you know, the, this is obviously an ongoing conversation, the big data that we have. Um, we have more and more big data um, and digital traces on all, covering all kinds of issues, but we still have this issue of um, changing populations in ways that we're not necessarily aware of. We don't know who our population necessarily is. So for a applied policy kind of perspective, that can be a little tricky. Um, so just to give a quick intro to these two different areas of, um, of network science and behavioral science, so on the left, and I'm going to use the example, so I work currently for the International Astronomical Union, and one of the um, things we work on is science communication, how to effectively engage people in science. Um, and currently, this is obviously a very hot topic with alternative facts and fake news being in the news a lot. Um, and it's a real issue. Um, how do people distinguish uh, real news and fake news, and also um, how they understand or misunderstand science. So one of the um, insights from network science, or concept from ne network science, would be echo chambers, how our social networks are structured such that we can end up in a social network where we only hear from people who share our same opinions. So on the left, we have a study that gathered data from policymakers in Washington, D.C. on the issue of there should be and, and ask them about their view on there should be an international binding agreement on all nations to reduce um, GHG emissions. Right, thanks. <laughs> um, and so the colors show whether they strongly agree or strongly disagree. So purple is strongly agree, red is strongly disagree. And we can see that, um, so the top right one is a Columbia University scientist. There's only one person in his network who strongly disagreed. The one next to it has nobody who strongly disagreed. Um, and then the bottom ones, the only one that's sort of has a diversity of opinion is the bottom right one. Um, basically, the study finds that most of the policymakers um, only discuss the issue within these very homogenous echo chambers. And so they never get new information on the sides. Um, and then complementing that approach or that idea of looking at our social network structures is the behavioral science approach. Um, and so this is a professor of science communication 
um, quoted on uh, discussing how people respond to information about vaccines, evidence about vaccines, um, and saying that essentially you can tell people that 87% of scientists believe that there's uh, no link between vaccines and autism, but parents will still um, look at this one study that was retracted that showed a link, and even though they know it was retracted, they'll still not want to take the risk. And so this is about understanding how people make decisions around risk, how they evaluate evidence, and the role of emotions and our cognitive biases, and how it's not about facts, really. I mean, it can be about facts, but it's not just about facts. And I think that's a lot of what the world is seeing right now with um, this whole debate about alternative facts. If I say it's a fact, which one are you going to believe? And all of those cognitive biases impact how people receive a message and what the most effective way to communicate the message is. Um, so in terms of communicating messages and um, science communication, the social network approach offers us a structural look at how we're organized um, within society. So how many of you have heard of network analysis or, um, okay. Cool. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so this is just to give you a sense of what it is. These are visualizations of social networks and some of the features that um, social network analysis can reveal about the networks that we live in. So in the top left, we have um, this illustration of the concept of homophily, which is that, again, like the echo chambers, that we tend to find ourselves in social networks where we're more densely connected to people who share characteristics and Classically, this one illustrates um, racial segregation within a social network, where the yellow nodes are uh, people who identified as white, and the green nodes are people who identified as black. Um, I think in a school or university, I can't remember, <laughs> sorry. Um, but this is fairly typical on multiple different dimensions. So not just race, but age and gender and education and socioeconomic status and interests. Almost every dimension, you can find some level of homophily in social networks. And then we can look at the bottom right, illustrates some of the different properties within a network structure that we can use in order to understand how to disseminate information or products or messages within a network. So we have people who, for example, bridge between two groups. So we have these clusters, um, which could be echo chambers of different kinds but are generally homophilous in some regard. And then you have people who bridge them, so those people are very important for contagion, for spreading a message through a network. We also have the people who are very central in the network, who a lot of people are tied to, and those people tend to have quite high status and to have a large influence on the people in their network. So it's important to be able to identify who those people are as well. Um, and then we have people who are quite isolated. And from a communication perspective or marketing perspective, you don't want to spend too much resources targeting those people. Um, but it's a useful, so those are just some, some people in a social network, right? Some roles or whatever that you would want to be aware of. Um, but then, um, in terms of actual practical application, um, when Sorry, I hope this isn't... It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things in applications of um, data science to social issues, to social policy questions, so for example, product dissemination or changing, often predicting, but not just predicting, but also wanting to change people's behaviors. Um, one of the issues that arises is this idea of levels of analysis. So in a, a social network is um, inherently, inherently has two levels. They have individuals and then also the relationships that we're in. Um, and then further, you can also have multi-level social networks or multi-level ordinary non-relational data sets. So um, for example, children in a school. So you have children as your first unit of analysis and then they're embedded in schools. And the schools can be tied, can have their own ties, and the children have ties between them, or can be tied to children in other schools. So you have these two different levels, the grouping level as well as the individual level. Um, often in big data applications, the idea of clustering and the second level um, are not attended to. And the fact that there is this difference between individuals and the clusters within which they exist. 
Um, and so this can cause problems in terms of inference and what you actually, how you actually interpret correlations at different levels. Because a correlation at a group level um, does not necessarily imply a correlation at the individual level. Um, and so that can be very confusing when you don't actually specify and think about whether your data are clustered in that way. Um, and in terms of understanding for complex system, sorry, um, how the system level and the individual level are going to affect future evolution, um, we can think about, so this is actually um, called the boat diagram from a field, certain a computational sociology way of like simplifying this idea. So that often what we're interested in is the macro level change. So that's um, the network at time one and the network at time four, so that link. And it can be intuitive to just try to analyze that link directly. Um, and I've seen a number of sort of data science approaches that try to do that, um, where you just look at the group level or network level characteristics and see what they were like at time one, and then see whether you can predict the network's structure or characteristics at time two, time three, time four. But for more robust analysis, I would argue, it would make sense to actually do what, what we would call use an actor-oriented approach or an agent-oriented approach and think about the individuals who actually form the system. So if the behavior, if the behavior is occurring at the individual unit level, as in a social network where individual people are making certain choices, and then their choices and their behaviors change the structure and the behavior of the whole then we want to actually go through that bottom level or that agent level and then that's where behavioral science would come in to understand how those agents are making those decisions. So they're changing their ties, they're changing their behaviors and that's influencing others in the network and so you have a macro level process but it's really the product of the individual units within the network making those decisions. And in actor oriented uh, network models which are longitudinal network models, um, you can model the probabilities of different agents making decisions on different variables and include variables at the agent level as well as the network level. Um, I'm not going to go into actor-oriented models very much. I'm trying to keep this non-technical, but if anyone's curious, I'm happy to share more after. Um, so to quite try to quickly give you an approach of like applications, um, a lot of ne uh, network science has looked at like diffusion and contagion processes um, in social networks. So of diseases, but also of messages and the innovations. Um, so this is a classic study showing um, diffusion of prescribing behavior among physicians, um, where they basically show that the physicians with the most network ties are the early adopters who quickly adopt a new drug and prescribe it, and those with the fewest ties are the slowest ones through because going a little too slowly. Um, but um, knowing that the most embedded people are the ones who adopt early does not mean that those are necessarily the most effective people to target with your communication message or your product um, because they're not necessarily the opinion leaders. Um, so the opinion so the, on the left we have a model of the rate of um, diffusion based on whether the opinion leaders are targeted and adopt the product versus random members of the social network versus people who are more isolated within the network. And so the message is essentially if you want a product to diffuse quickly and you want to speed up contagion, you need to figure out who the opinion leaders are and then you also need to be effective in convincing opinion leaders. So what studies show is that this is where behavioral science is really important that actually convincing opinion leaders can be very difficult. Opinion leaders tend to have, especially with ideas, have a um, lower susceptibility to infection, if you think of ideas as infectious. Um, so you need to think carefully about how to target them. Um, and in science communication, this is very important um, to make sure that those opinion leaders are effectively targeted so you don't backfire in what you're trying to do. Um, so then we bring data science into this picture. So there's been a lot of work in network science and bringing it together with behavior science. 
And now we add the data revolution, the availability of big data, and um, a lot of issues around the assumptions I was talking about earlier, the last Mark Wahlberg slide, um, and the sample sizes are taken care of by the big data. Um, so we don't have uh, statistical power issues anymore when we have a big data set. Um, so we have these amazing network data sets now. Um, <laughs> um, so for example, Twitter is a classic. Um, Twitter, Facebook, social media, those are all um, network data sets um, that can be used to understand both social network structures, social network interactions, and also um, contagion and diffusion of ideas and people's decisions within those. Um, and so these, um, these visualizations show um, the spread of information, false information and true information about the flu on the left and about vaccines on the right. And again, we see this idea of like echo chambers and we can see the nodes that are the most densely connected. The big ones are the ones that have a lot of followers. Um, so those would be probably the opinion leaders um, who disseminate the information very effectively. Um, and it's, it's definitely an amazing resource for actually being able to model how these contagion processes occur. Um, I think, well, yeah. Um, we've seen a lot of examples, and I think people are not necessarily even aware of how much, um, for example, election campaigns make use, make actual use of that network approach and combine it with behavioral science to target individuals. And from a development perspective, science communication, education, and in general, combating alternative facts of all of those um, social justice causes, um, there needs to be more use of this integration, I think. Um, and um, what data science, I mean, so I, I think this kind of, I try to summarize what each of these actually brings to the table. Um, I think data science brings a huge amount that can, um, that is already, not that can, but that is already um, making the power of network science and behavior science combined when applied in these contexts quite, actually quite terrifying in a way. Um, because for example, network models um, are computationally very intensive. Even when you're not working with big data, they're computationally intensive. And so often with longitudinal models, especially multi-level ones, they're in, almost always implemented in the Bayesian framework. Now with big data, that's a computational challenge. Um, to actually implement the network models is quite difficult. So you definitely need data scientists to work on that. Um, and it also changes what is possible in terms of um, simulating network processes and being able to predict the evolution of networks over time um, to be able to do that. Um, it, we can also, using big data sets, infer all kinds of individual level uh, characteristics um, that aren't necessarily obvious or measured um, in traditional data sets. So, and, and I think there's been a lot of press around this in, in Facebook or Google or um, Twitter figuring out you know, what gender you are, what background you come from, what your education characteristics are based on your search patterns, based on your friends, based on your behavior. So that's an inference that can then expand what, um, what we can actually test and know in um, combining the behavioral science and network science approach. Me messages can then, using behavioral insights, you can then tailor your messages um, so specifically, but through those inferred characteristics, right? You can identify these tiny, tiny subpopulations within your data set population and target your messages to them in a way that was not, uh, that was never possible before. So that's quite a lot of power to influence um, what we know from behavioral science is that we're actually very easily influenced in ways we're not even aware of because of our cognitive biases. So it's a little bit scary that that can be done, but that is a possibility when these approaches are integrated. That's, that's about it. Well, <laughs> oh, exactly. Great. Thank, thank you. Any questions for Eddie? I think it's a, uh, yep, there we go, Andre? Um, I was just wondering, so in, in the, um, 
in dealing with, with different groups, uh, identifying different groups, what sort of method do you use to define closeness? Um, do you use things like by plots to visualize them? How, how does that go about? Do you mean like in a network analysis to identify peaks or? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and that really depends on what your group of interest is so, and on how your network population is defined. So at the broadest level, you might start with just having um, defining components in a network, so, which is quite easy. That's, so any group that isn't um, connected at all, right, that has no ties cutting across. Um, within, within components, then you can use, there are a lot of different measures. So, I don't know, I can tell you more after maybe because, right. um, yeah, yeah, it depends on what, what you want to do and often you would use multiple measures. I've got some more questions as well, but I, I think we have to move on to the next speakers getting late. Ellie, thanks once again. It was great. It's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you. Ellie, it's, it's you. So most of what I'm talking about today is how do we compensate um, for the fact that our sample sizes were so tiny. Um, so why do we care about trying to distinguish plant species from each other? Um, most of it has to do with environmental impact assessments. So if um, climate change, for example, is affecting a particular ecosystem, we may lose out on certain niche species as they start to fall away. Um, it's also very useful when you're talking about expansions of human settlements or various industrial actions in a particular area. Um, typically this is done through DNA barcodes. So a DNA barcode is just a very small region of DNA. Um, they're ubiquitous across pretty much all plants, and so that works very effectively um, for most species. But when you get to things that are more recently evolved, there isn't enough time uh, for the mutations to occur in that region so that you can actually distinguish the species from each other. Um, so South Africa is a really interesting place to study this phenomenon, specifically because it has so many recently evolved species. And this happened during the last ice age, which was fairly mild in South Africa, Australia, and parts of South America. And so you have these regions where you didn't freeze over and die. <laughs> you have these families that are able to, to survive and thrive and speciate at a very rapid rate. Um, so because of this, there isn't a lot of variation in those particular DNA barcoding regions. Um, these species are also what we call endemic. That means they only grow here. So once they die, they're gone forever. They don't occur anywhere else in the world. So it's kind of important that we figure out what they are um, and label them in some ways so that we can monitor their existence. Um, so my approach was trying to apply some data science methods to distinguish these species using chemical profiles rather than DNA profiles. And theoretically, this approach would be faster and cheaper than DNA barcoding, or would supplement DNA barcoding approaches. Um, 
So, a little bit about plants and chemistry. Um, plants are chemically much more interesting than humans or pretty much anything else on the planet. And this happens because we start with photosynthesis, you have your carbon dioxide, and your water, and your sunlight, and you make sugar. And that's what most people know about plant metabolism. But how it actually works is that you start with that sugar and then you break it down and you build onto it in a process called metabolism. And primary metabolism is focused on carbohydrates, nitrogen, and fatty acid metabolism. And with those basic building blocks, you build a cell and you can maintain cellular homeostasis. Um, what's interesting about plants, even though all these other creatures that crawl around the earth can do this, they make an extraordinary number of what we call secondary metabolites. And these metabolites are produced um, to try to interact with their environment. What most people don't really think about with plants is that they can't run away. You know, you can't just get up and move when the sun is too bright or when there's an herbivore chomping down on your leaves or when you're trying to have sex. So you have to react with your entire environment in a, in a chemical manner. And so, you know, in, in terms of defense, you can produce either toxins or antipalatability complexes to make yourself taste bad. Um, when it comes to sex, obviously there are lots of um, floral patterns and uh, various different kinds of attractants that can be produced. And when it comes to things like abiotic, abiotic stress, high UV light, you'll notice that your, a lot of your succulents will start turning red. So you get all those sunscreen pigments, essentially. So um, the study of metabolites generally is called metabolomics, and all of the metabolites in a sample are a metabolic fingerprint. What we're trying to do, or what I tried to do, um, using these data science approaches and feature selection was make a, a metabolic barcode that we could then use to imprint on a specific species and identify it. So there were only five. <laughs> um, we had three field sites in the Mapolin, which again is seven hours away from UCT, so it was, it was a little bit difficult to get there. Um, and two of these species specifically are very difficult to separate using normal DNA markers. The interesting thing about this family in particular is that it has two different carbon uptake mechanisms. So one of them it uses in the winter when the, the conditions are a little cushy, it's cooler, the sun's not so bright, and there's lots of water. Um, the other one is used during the summer when it's hot and dry and there's very intense UV radiation. Um, the second method is a lot less efficient, but it doesn't lose as much water, so the plants are able to survive in the summertime. Um, it, some studies have found that there are certain secondary metabolites that can only be produced when these plants are using one carbon uptake mechanism or the other. And so we have this really interesting switch that may be a focal point for um, classification issues. Uh, so because of a lot of different factors I don't have time to get into, we were only able to collect a total of 50 samples across five species. The main experiment um, that our data collection really comes from is lipid chromatography mass spectrometry. And so in this, in this process, you take a leaf, you smash it up, you extract the metabolites, you inject it into a high-performance lipid chromatography system that separates each of the molecules, or the metabolites from each other. You pass that to an ionizer that either uh, snaps a proton on or takes it off, and then thus is an ionized molecule that gets thrown into the mass spec, um, which gives you the relative mass and abundance of each of those ions. When we look at the data, it looks something like this. So these are our spectra. And along our x-axis, we have the amount of time it takes to get through the machine. Our y-axis is the mass, and our z-axis is the relative abundance of each of the ions. Um, what's interesting about this is that you can see from just the spectra that these two plants look relatively similar. These two plants are the ones that we have difficult separating using DNA, and they also look quite similar. And this guy looks nothing like any of the rest of them. Um, just to keep count, we've got 50 samples, and at the end of the pre-processing of this data, we had 23,000 ions. So obviously our feature selection was critically important in order to do anything with this data set. Um, so we decided to approach this by considering variance. And I'll get into that a little bit more um, as I go on. But we start by uh, doing this unit value decomposition and applying out our PCA. Um, and what we found was that in our first PCA, which covered 52% of the variance, we had one species essentially that separated from the other four. 
So this is obviously disconcerting. If all of your variance is describing separation of one species, then in your classification of the other four, you may have some really serious issues, um, especially with the low sample size. Um, but despite all of that, we carry on. Um, we, these are the two that are hard to separate using DNA. Um, so we were expecting them to have more overlap, but these two species actually had the greatest amount of overlap, which is kind of interesting. Um, we decided that to use a random threshold, as we tend to, of 90% uh, variance covered. And we found that the first 12 PCs covered 90% of the total variance in the data. Um, in order to make sense of that and determine the variance um, attributed to each of our variables or our ions, we applied leverage scores. So leverage scores hail with information theory and it basically tells you how informative each of your variables are. So we take the loading matrix, um, we take out our PCs, we sum the variance represented by each PC for each ion, and then divide that by the total variance. And in this way, we're able to get the total variance represented by each ion. Um, when we plot all of this out, we find that 99% of the variance is described by less than 3% of our variables. So this is sort of an incredible thing in some ways, because we know that most of these compounds are primary metabolites, and we know that because these plants are coming from a similar lineage, that we have a, a huge grouping of things that are going to be very similar between these species. So even when it comes to secondary metabolism, a lot of these things will be common. Um, but also, because mass spec is the way that it is, we have some trouble when it comes to pre-processing and eliminating redundant variables. So we again set a random threshold at 90%, and we found that this was 121 ions. When we actually pair that down and look at what those ions are, we found that we could reduce that from 121 to 105. So our scorecard reads 50 samples, 105 variables. And that's going into the... Um, so <laughs> the trick with um, going into the modeling, of course, is that you have to split things to training and testing sets. So for us, we knew that there was this intrinsic bias in the data. We knew that we have this carbon uptake switch, and that at that point in time, we were going to change the way that the metabolism was working. And so along with the mass spec, which was obviously the main experiment, we ran 32 other um, experiments along with that. So it was a, a wide variety of um, physiological variables uh, for the species, nutrient variables, climate variables, um, soil variables, and other things. And the idea was that we were trying to determine when these metabolic switches were going to occur. So I've given just a small handful of, of those. And this is a small handful of our um, features that we selected. Um, using leverage scores. And this is a correlation matrix. So I like it because it's quantitative and qualitative, which is always kind of cool. But we have the positive correlations in blue and the inverse correlations in red. And what this really means in the long, in the long term is that um, the ion abundance is actually correlated to the seasons. And so if we have a correlation between abundance and season, will we actually be able to distinguish a plant, plant metabolites picked in the summer using um, a model that was based on winter samplings? So in order to try to determine the robustness of building such models, we specifically split the data between summer and winter samples, and then trained and tested um, on both to see how they would work. So that gets us to random forest. We ultimately selected random forest because it's known for being able to handle fairly low sample numbers. And this is because of its inborn um, bootstrapping function, which they call boosting. Um, the sample classes are unequal, um, which has to do with the fact that leaves fall off on some of the species. So that was unfortunate. Um, but the minority class is not less than 10% of the total sample number. and so using normal, or what I've learned at least in data science um, approaches, we were able to go forward without too much stress there. Um, the models were trained on one season and tested on the other, as I just described. When we looked at the, the training set, there was a 0% out-of-back error rate for both models, and our k-fold cross-validation gave 0% for the winter model and 2.4 for the summer model. 
Um, then when we got to the training set, we decided on log loss. And that was specifically because we were moving, we, were not, we didn't have a binary classifier, so using AUC wasn't um, necessarily as effective. And log loss is able to handle that multiple classifier problem fairly well. The other aspect of this is that it penalizes very heavily on false positives. And so for us, because that's the, the question we're trying to answer, can you actually accurately identify the species? Um, that was a, a specifically very important aspect for us. So when we used that evaluation metric, we found a 0.39 score for the winter model and a 0.36 score for the summer model. So all of these are, are very low. And if we had more data, I would be very excited about these results. But it's a little sketchy because of the low sample number that we're working with. So in order to try to beef it up and make sure that we're not just sampling air, um, we tried a few more things. So the first was to look at how this is typically um, done. And what I mean by typically done, I mean that in most labs, if you were going to perform this experiment, you would go into the, the lab and look on the shelf and say, we have this 150 quantitative standards. Let's stick them in the machine, and then we'll quantify that across all of our samples, and those will be our features. And so we did an ancillary version of this, where instead of looking at those specific, um, instead of using standards, we went back and into the literature, and from about 42 different resources, pulled all the compounds that had been found previously in azoaceous species. About 120 of those ended up being present in our LCMS data. And then we built a model based off of that. And so Here's the data from the feature selection model, and here's the data from our pre-identified compounds only model. And as you can see, it scored very, very poorly. Um, what's interesting was actually looking at the multidimensional scaling um, and seeing from the first and second dimensions that there's essentially no uh, clustering whatsoever of our species. So this was a very ineffective way of going about it. Um, as compared to our, our um, feature selection model, where we were able to classify, again, Galenia africana is always happy and by itself. Um, what was interesting here was that our, our DNA um, tricky plants separated very well, but the one overlap was still overlapping, which probably accounts for the area of log loss in the summer model. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to look at was, is our feature selection model um, or is our feature selection effective as compared to a randomly selected features? And so we took a Monte Carlo approach and sampled 125 ions randomly 500 times and then looked at their out-of-bag error rate and their log loss. And what we found was that we had a mean or a median um, out-of-bag error rate that was about 9.2 or 92% and then a log loss that was around uh, 1.52. So these are very high scores and obviously not very effective. Interestingly, the randomly sampled um, features fare better than our um, specifically sampled compounds as a model. So just some brief conclusions. Our feature selection approach beat the normal and the random sampling approaches. So at least our feature selection seems to be working. Um, the implications of this are that if we continue with this work um, and worked on it a little bit more, we may be able to have a way to rapidly confirm species identification. So that would be really cool. Uh, one of the things I didn't have a lot of time to talk about, but is an implication of any, any work really with secondary metabolites, is that about 60% of modern pharmaceuticals are based off of secondary metabolites. Now some of these are from plants, or some of these are from fungi and bacteria, but the vast majority are actually from plants. So if you can effectively separate secondary metabolites from the rest of the metabolome, load, it's a much more advanced process for bringing forward novel drug candidates, potential novel drug candidates. Um, the other aspect of this is that if you can look at plants that are related to each other, a lot of these secondary metabolites are very difficult to synthesize in the lab. So if you can find a, a species that's related to another species that's easier to grow, then you can biofarm compounds that could be potential novel drug candidates. So those are sort of interesting implications. Obvious steps, we need to help all our samples. Um, it would be great also to include a number of species to start building um, a database of barcodes so we have a better idea of what's happening on a, on a um, 
more phenological level, so across um, a family rather than just in a few species. The other thing is that we, it would be really interesting to add samples that are from different regions um, and see if, the, if there's regional specificity in metabolic uh, performance for these species. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any, any questions? Go for it. Uh, you said you used the multi class boosted. Uh, you said you used the multi class classifier boosted trees. Were you doing R or Python? R. R. Okay. I'm a biologist, we all use R. It's fine with you, you. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with R. Uh, okay, awesome. Any other questions? Okay, there's one at the back. that would be ideal. And if we had more samples that we were looking at, that's obviously a really good way to go because then you have less variance when you're actually trying to apply data later on. Um, in this particular case, in this application, we wanted as much of that in there as possible to prove that it was possible at all. Any other questions? Good question. Good stuff. Thank you very much. energy, weather, film, finance, and astronomy. So, like in health, so um, there are kind of three big areas there in molecular modeling. So, people doing drug design using fancy molecular modeling codes. Um, the image processing, so uh, those are cardiograms, so use GPUs to help uh, doctors speed up the processing of the cardiograms. 
And then, of course, in bioinformatics, there's all the gene sequencing that happens. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's particularly relevant to the sequence vector. But bioinformatics is often interpreted as much more broadly. In construction, so Charles was a Russian left. He was helping um, to design buildings so that to minimize the impact of wind. Um, there were people looking at improving water treatment. And in energy, some pretty interesting things, looking at battery materials and smelting. So with the smelting, you have to model, um, well, obviously smelting takes enormous amounts of power, and you want to try and cut down the power usage so you can um, decrease that power usage by modeling the, the, or both the physics and the sort of fluids there. Um, then that's a very useful thing to be doing, so the people doing that at the CHPC. And then these ocean and climate change people use up huge amounts of time, and um, yeah, that's the one example where actually people really are using machine learning, where they take data on small parts of the ocean and try and do um, predictions on what else is happening in other parts of the ocean. Okay, so like I say, I'm an astrophysicist, so we have a lot of, um, sort of real, actually doing astronomy, using the facilities, so theoretical calculations, uh, galaxy evolution, we simulate these huge chunks of universe, in-body simulations, um, so that's simulation, but we also do data mining, so with Israel Salilo, we um, use data that was available from a satellite telescope to probe something about dark matter and dark energy using the cosmic microwave backgrounds that light through the universe. And then with uh, Andor at Simba Zafi, we were measuring the expansion rate of the universe um, at half its age, so that was using model fitting and statistics, so all data science with some of our own data from the Southern African Large Telescope, and then um, with VJ Chumru, um, looking at the relating dark matter to luminous matter, and that involved a couple of data mining as well, and monitoring. So you get a sense of how in astronomy there's a lot of uh, data science being done. I see quite a few ex-astronomers around here not doing astronomy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess you've heard of the Square Kilometer Array, a billion dollar radio telescope for 2020 plus. Phase one has 200 dishes in South Africa and an array in Australia. And phase two has antenna all over Africa. So um, one of my jobs has been to do computing development in, the, in these African partner countries. In fact, this is how I got drawn into this data science activity because um, when you're talking about computing development in other parts of Africa, it's, Astronomy is often not a good starting point. I'd rather talk about projects that have kind of immediate and more obvious impact. So I started looking for data science projects outside of astronomy. Um, obviously with the SKA, it really is a huge computational telescope. It's, uh, the data will be more than 10 times the current internet data <laughs> on the telescope. Quite a bit of data, although you know, it's a long way in the future. And there are many levels of data crunching, hardware accelerators, image processing, um, visualization. You have to detect sources like radio galaxies and huge multi-dimensional data spaces. You have to do statistical analysis of the resulting catalogs of galaxies and then compare the models with data. So that involves that kind of thing I was talking about before. <coughs> you model big chunks of the universe to see if you can make galaxies that look like the galaxies that you see. Okay, so those are all more kind of um, computational things, and actually one thing that's become really quite important in astronomy is these kind of data portals and places where large collaborations can talk to each other easily about their data. In the past, astronomers worked in different groups, it was much easier. Now we have people spread all over the world in different time zones, and it's actually the, the sort of the social interaction is becoming increasingly more important. So just quickly about this um, computer development in Africa. Um, it being that we've had lots of visits, well, visits 22 people. We've got over 200 contacts in the database. So if anyone's looking to do stuff in computing in the rest of Africa, um, I know lots of people. And um, yeah, so we've been distributing some hardware. We do CISA admin training and some data science and astronomy courses. Um, and like I said, we're looking for data science projects. And in fact, one thing Werner was involved in is um, a, a, it's a, a project 
where they're looking for local data sets that could be analyzed um, in a sort of, with the help of experts from, from the UK. So if you do know of kind of open data sets that could benefit from that sort of thing, then talk to me or him. So those are the, the eight countries, Zambia, Mauritius, Namibia, Botswana, Madagascar, Kenya, Ghana, Mozambique. And uh, I would say that this computing development, well, the key thing is trying to develop the people on the ground, get people on the ground working in astronomy and other fields, in the projects, in useful things like agriculture, health, mining, tourism. And uh, we need to have a view to jobs and commerce. So I'd really like to see all the spending on the SKA project actually be useful for people in other fields and other places. And if you're interested in working in the rest of Africa, the last mile networking is something that we should really tackle together. Um, and yeah, another thing that I, I came to talk is we talk about all kind of online community development, so this Leah really, thing is great, the communication with the, uh, the Nigerian yeah. data science people look very positive. I actually had a really fantastic um, sort of day-long workshop with people in Kenya using video, which just worked perfectly, actually. Yeah. So it really is possible to do this kind of virtual supervision. And I've got to say quickly about the CSBC training. We do info Linux and Python parallel program applications courses, and we provide quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one support for research scientists. And we have this fantastic student cluster competition where we train up students to build um, small clusters. And then they've gone off to Germany to compete against the Chinese postgraduates and the Germans. And, the, and three times the South African undergraduates have won this competition. Cool. So it's really pretty impressive. Yeah. And twice from UWC, I can say. I have a position with UWC. <laughs> okay, so here's my summary. So the same for high performance computing in South Africa. We have lots of users and many fields. Um, and we would like to have more industry engagement involved in the SKA projects. I talked about the astrophysics project we're doing, because that's uh, post nature of God and the dark energy. And yeah, we're doing this computing development in African partner countries, so if you're interested in that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, um, I just want to say you mentioned the facilities are available at pretty low cost. So you don't need to go to Amazon, you can go to CHBC. <laughs> uh, you can still go to Amazon. But by the way, can you actually um, look at Spark and those type of things as well? So, within the, within the, uh, we have the still advanced, right? We have within the still advanced computer engineering lab, they are looking at various kind of cloud offerings and yeah, so maybe somebody Come from that lab. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay, it's very late, so I want to get the guy from Cameroon Rockefeller up. It's the last one. I think he's going to be quick. Um, he's going to visualize. I think he's going to do it. It's just a bit see if the guy's still there. Um, he's there. <laughs> I must apologize, Rockefeller. Can you hear me? <laughs> Okay, great. Sorry? Uh, and you guys can hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, maybe if you can just speak up, we can actually we could have you the, Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Are you going to share your screen? Okay. Okay, let me just share my screen. Uh, yeah, is it right now? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Uh, I see myself. Hey, I'm sorry, you see your screen. That's right. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Rob Fair. Um, my field of interest is actually machine learning and data science. Um, I'm also um, a recent alumni student from Ames. Um, it's really my pleasure to be to take part of this event and to actually give this presentation where the title is actually a visualization of Twitter data in Python. Okay, the goal of this presentation is actually to, to show you how a couple of lines of code can let you free 
or how, how this data, real-time data from Twitter, and actually do some interesting analysis with it. So, in my presentation, I'm, I'm going to gather data from, from Twitter using a specific keyword. And I'll add that in. Then, I'll, I'll show you guys how to run these tweets with the purpose of targeting relevant tweets. And I'm also be plotting some, some charts of those data. And at the end, I'm going to introduce some type of application that those data can be used for, uh, such as text classification, social network analysis, and also sentiment analysis. Okay, um, first of all, there's something um, I, I really like to do anytime I'm, I'm doing some presentation in Python. It's trying actually to, to hit my keyboard and type this big code. This input is actually uh, let you guys know what Python is all about. So, it's actually concerned with. Um, um, let me just type in. Oh, that's wrong. Um, okay, I can't talk about like it. It's actually a couple of sentences written politically that lets you know what person is about. So, uh, in order to give you a short description about Twitter as a researcher, Twitter is actually a real time, highly social microblogging service that allows British developers to actually post short message less than 140 characters. And those pages are called tweets. And in this presentation, I'm going to call someone who's using Twitter a tweeter. Actually, nowadays, uh, Twitter is actually one of the great, great time data providing in terms of human knowledge. And the point is, unlike social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn, where the connection is actually bidirectional, bidirectional means uh, members have to approve the social connection. Twitter has an asymmetric network infrastructure. That means uh, anyone can find anyone. That's the great thing about Twitter. And as a simple application of uh, my presentation, it's actually you can use this code to actually find in trains related to specific, some specific words and actually gathering feedback about product and services. So let's get started. The method I'm going to use to achieve this task is called uh, the Twitter Stream API. What is API? API is which stands for application uh, programming database. It's actually a tool designed by a particular website to actually give out the data and to allow the web, web application to actually interact with both data. So, before accessing uh, Twitter to API, there are four pieces of information that are required. Uh, namely, an API key, an API secret, an access token, and like, an access token secret. Those four pieces of information which let you guys to have all app on Twitter actually to harvest data. So, if you want to create yours, just have to follow these steps I'll actually have over there. Go to that website and Click on create new app and let me, let me just do it in order for you guys to know how this tool works. Yeah, this is the, the page of Twitter apps dashboard. So, so, from there, you just have to click on create your new app, and from there, everything becomes particularly easy. You just have to adjust fill those down the name of your apps, description, website, and whatever. So after that, we're ready to create a Twitter application. And the next page is going to, to show you I mean, the API key, the key access, and the access token will be available. You can just copy and paste on your, I mean, on your network or your text reader if you want. So, and in the same process, you're going to scroll down and create your access token and an access token secret. So, for this presentation, um, the module I'm, I'm actually using for doing this is actually TweetBy. And from TweetBy, I'm going to import stream of vendor and stream later. And let us do this it. Okay. And all those different keys uh, I copy from my Twitter app is actually over there. It's actually a sequence of letter uh, and in chats on lower case and numbers also. And those four, those four pieces are actually um, the one I told you before. So let me just uh, load it. So uh, the main code is over there. I'm actually creating a class uh, called public, which takes the string data object as argument. And uh, I'm just telling my, I mean, my code to create a new file, in this case called tweety.txt, and to store any piece of data we collect from Twitter in it. So I'm not going to, to run this code off from there because it's going to take some time to load data. And you don't actually don't have actually enough time. And in order to, to actually uh, show you guys how this how this thing works, I've written the same code for my test editor. Uh, let me just show you guys. 
get the same product you have to your regular. I return to work from my terminal to uh, and for, And first of all, let me just uh, specify the keyword. I'm not trying to do some research on it. And, and in this case, I will take Africa. Uh, let me just change it and use it a uh, uh, next word. Let me just call it that That's very famous right now. Okay. And if I want it, um, let me go over to the code. Okay. okay. What you're saying right now is actually, um, I'm actually collecting data from the trailer in, in the JSON format. And you're going to take some time to, to get more richer data sets, but uh, the process is actually okay. So, uh, for those who are not seeing me, uh, okay, this is fine. So, uh, we're just trying to interrupt that code because it might take some time to load, it, I mean, to load my, my data set. Okay, control C is the key to do that. Okay, so after doing that, so I suppose you guys have, uh, uh, I mean, I've seen how I, I got to collect my data. So, after that, I'm, I'm, there's an off offline method where I, I, just, I just have to, to, to insert my consulate and password secret. And now I am ready to learn the process. So now after collecting the data, now comes the time to mine the tweet. And in order to do this, I'm going to import the JSON module from, from Python, which is actually the module from doing with JSON format. And in for record, the data coming as a JSON format is format. This is not for you guys, you guys may know that JavaScript object annotation is actually a um, bit of uh, Collection of uh, dictionaries, which is made of keys and values, keys and values, which actually really, really easy to, to understand uh, both by machine and by user, which is this case, not me myself. So after that, I'm going to put my public, which is actually a library for plugging, several for boots, plots, and actually pandas for lab for data analysis. Okay. Rafa, let me just make your screen slightly bigger and just for, for people to see it at the back. We can see it in front quite well, but just... Okay, I, I, I don't understand, but... No, that's no, right. Continue. It's fine. Okay, um, now I'm going to... Uh, what I'm doing actually right now is that I'm actually creating uh, my bag of tools. But this is actually my bag where I'm going to... I mean, to fill this back with tweets I collect from, from the internet. So, um, after doing that, um, let me just check how many tweets I, I have in my back, actually. And for the moment, I, I have 3,497 tweets in my back, actually. So, but in, when you're talking about machine learning, this data is actually not so meaningful because you need to do some concrete credentials analysis. It is more than uh, a much richer data set, which may take uh, around uh, 100,000 tweets, for instance. So, after that, let, let us check uh, the first tweets in my back. Okay. Uh, it's, it's actually um, a piece in the weird form that uh, the inside of the understand what's going on. It's actually the first tweets actually back from Twitter. So, if I want uh, to make it clear, I will just extract some feature from that's the dictionary. And the feature that means, uh, that means a lot to us is actually uh, the text, the long text, the language, the location, and the follower counts, who's actually not going to follow us, the user, this half, this half actually. And yeah, also much information about the user, and time, step, time, step, time stamp is actually uh, the feature which is allowing allow me to, uh, to perform analysis for any place of the world, depending on what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, what I'm actually doing my analysis. So, then, after creating my data frame, which is actually made of the text, the language, the location of the Twitter, the Twitter, and the follower accounts, and let us see now what this first tweet looks like. Okay, the first is actually, uh, let us read it. India, South Africa, ready for the final, for final of ECC Women's World Cup qualifier, 2017. That's the first tweet, and if you want to see in, in the data frame, okay, this is the first tweet, and it has been written in English, and the location, the guy is from Guarda in India, and he has 8,557 followers. Yeah. 
and let us check the, the first 10 tweets. Okay, this is actually the first 10 tweets. You guys know wait. Um, and, um, okay, and now let us just select some tweets and try to read it. For instance, the 3002 to a second tweet. Uh, tell us how overall South Africa kept on international airport and Chigali international airport. We are ranking first and second best on the content. This is the best kind of this. The tweets are actually better from Twitter. And, and the first things, uh, okay, let us see this guy is actually tweeting to Donald Trump. Yes. And now, um, I think what I'm going to do now is um, imagine, for instance, um, um, in South Africa, I, I want to do my analysis, and the other one is at my fellow movie in, I mean, in Zambia, in, in, they really want to do the same analysis. But we have different time depending on our, on our country. But Python is really help us to, with the daytime model to, to deal with that. On the sake of togetherness, I'm going to create two kinds of one from the giant book and the other, other one from the one that one is actually sitting in Canada. So, and also Python can offer a bunch of ties on that you guys by you know, using to perform your, your, your own analysis. And we can we, we might find yours over there. There's actually a couple of cities, Kampala, Chatun, Tigali, Kinshasa, and so on and so forth. So, I actually want to, to get a precise, I mean, accurate information about the dialogue in the tweets, for instance. And by precise, by accurate, I mean, even the accurate time in terms of uh, milliseconds and seconds. Okay, let me not check, let me not show you, you guys how these things work first. And the first tweet has been, has been written on the 20th February at uh, 3 p.m. to 10 seconds and a couple of minutes seconds. It's actually more accurate for doing nice analysis. Okay, now, suppose now we can do some tweets to catch my interest and I want to get more information about the dialogue in the tweet. By more information, I mean the day you create your Twitter account, how many foreign girls this guy have, and the location from, from when, from where he has created his account. Actually, his name on, on Twitter, even though he might change it, we have this IT feature who can actually let us keep track this guy. So, okay, for instance, uh, the first twist has created his account on May 19th, and his IT on Twitter is actually uh, this couple of numbers. If the guy and his name is Perry, the location is Guadal, India, and he also have an HTTP address for, for getting for getting actually his, his profile picture on Twitter. So you guys might might do it for for other tweets. Okay. Now let's go, let us just filter our tweets. First of all, I'm gonna filter my tweets by location, for instance. I wanna I wanna I wanna know how many tweets have been generated from South Africa, for instance. Okay. okay, it's actually we have at least 62 tweets from South Africa and if you want to see all those tweets, you don't have to, 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 to hit scale up by this, with this comment. Okay, this is actually a bunch of tweets which have been done from South Africa, you guys might see it, it's actually quite nice. So, and now I want to filter those tweets also by language and to see how many, I mean, how many users and the language they're actually using for, for doing the tweets. I think the case, what do we have? We have um, the majority is in English, of course, and the second, the second one is in T. We start for Tuanego, I mean, it's from level from Philippine, and the third one um, yeah, is also French, Italian, Spanish, Jamaica, Indian, and so on and so forth. Okay, but from there, you, you might be interested in reading uh, some random tweets. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the tweet is actually in English. I will take some someone in the room who can understand Danish. He can help us with translating this. I mean, this Danish sentence. Those can read it. And now, for for getting things more clear, I'm going to to actually cut the difference by the top five languages which have been used to, to for, for doing all those tweets. Okay. Okay. This is actually the first five, the, the top five language which have been used to, to do those tweets. And in the first position we have English, and in the last the five to fifth position we have uh, in. Okay, and the third one is. Uh, can you guys hear me? 
Yeah. 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 And I mean, now it's that um, most of the trees have been done from a number of locations. So the trees, the trees also have not preserved their location. And the second one from Nigeria, the third one from Africa is to the north. And a couple of them from South Africa, Lagos, United States, and Johannesburg, London, and so also Paris, and, so, and also this Arabic country, and now I'll do it. So uh, <laughs> now, uh, let me go uh, on uh, the top five location of, of the tree of. From where the trees have been made. Okay, um, most of them have, the, the trees have not precise the, the, the location. Second one is from Nigeria, and the fifth one is from Northern in India. So, now in Nigeria, for instance, um, uh, we, are, we are still in the process that a um, couple of them will be setting trees, catch up interest, and also someone like all those people who are trees about Africa. Uh, we may want to find uh, if those trees are actually related to science or football, for instance, or light grants or clean climate, or then uh, this, uh, this line of code could let you, uh, is actually person checking over all the trees and just collecting all the trees where the, the word science is in it, the word climate is in it. So um, I'm, I'm telling my function to return to any time is meet up. Um, to, uh, the tweets where the word size is in it. So let me just do it. I'm going to show you guys. Okay. For, for the first 10 tweets, you know, uh, most of the time there is no science, there is no football, but uh, the, 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 um, the, the next tweet is actually um, talking about language. So that's why we actually get, 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 get back to in these columns. So I want to check uh, how many trees are actually related to, to the climate for instance. We have uh, I mean, seven trees related to migrant and 3,419 related to which not related to migrant. And, and we want to see, I mean, all the specs, all the trees we have to related to, to the climate for instance. This is a problem to do that. You can actually check that yourself. And also bank. We have 16 streets of the bank to the bank. Oh, that's not so nice. But people don't like, don't like money. Actually. So, and the different text, we are in my check also from the bank. And now, I, I'm, I'm looking for uh, some tweets that's actually dealing with bank and climate at the same time. There's a comment to do that in, in Python. Okay, there's also one tweet that's actually taking into account both. It's actually um, to find uh, to the fourth so that's my team, not much more information about the guy who did it. So, talking about now uh, real world application, there's something called emotional energy that's the number of text classification. This classification is actually a emotional problem. Sometimes you might be supervised and unsupervised. And what I actually kind of do with not is I can now um, collect all those raw text. You know, machine models actually do math. But, but in this case, you know, um, human knowledge, which in this case, tweets, is actually a raw text, and such a text. And if you can do something to turn all those raw text into a uh, numerical data, you might increase the number of models our machine learning I mean, can learn from. So, what I can do from this case, I can use scikit learn in Python to do what we call um, sectoral organization and tokenization. It's actually um, learning the vocabulary of any piece of tweet and extract some tokens from it. And from there, we're going to ask, we're going to end up with a huge space, space matrix where, um, where, the, where um, the column will be the tokens, I mean, the words, I mean, the words uh, which have been learned by the vocabulary, the vocabulary office, and the sound block will be all the documents for our piece of tweets. I, I, I can get aside, get excited and talk about it in the, in the next meetups. So, mm -hmm. now we can now do, um, if you have time, to, to go ahead and elaborate any of the tweets. Suppose, for instance, I want to check whether the tweet is relevant or not. Relevant now is, it might be um, talking about, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in know whether, whether the tweet is actually talking about science or not. 
That means I'm going to assign a zero to two is talking about, we not talking about science, and one to two is talking about science. So I can go ahead and label up my different trees with some huge tasks. And now I can apply uh, some common algorithm like um, uh, next base or logistic regression to actually predict uh, in, the, in the future whenever I, I'm, I'm actually getting some new trees, if whether this trees is actually whatever or not. So using the cycle in, uh, in, in Python, we can actually do that. There's also um, um, social network analysis, which actually a couple of mix um, between um, sociology and computer science. So uh, social network analysis is actually the study of human's relationship and, and using graph theory, which is actually the theory that I uh, realized. So suppose, for instance, um, we and we denote off all of the treatos as a, as nodes and we call it vertex in, in graph theory. And the relationship between all the treatos actually the fact that I'm tuning to you or the, the and the fact that I'm I'm retweeting what you actually to before. And we might end up with um, uh, this network or uh, let me call it just graph. And from this graph, what we can notice is uh, Frida is actually the most interested, the most interested person. Since actually couple of people actually following following her, and Tim, which is actually in nice isolated vertex, is not so interested. So <laughs> if you want to, I mean, if you want to um, check uh, the people of interest, you might use all those tweets and using social network analysis, using the network X library in Python, we can do that. So if the data is growing bigger, I mean, we are supposed we have uh, millions of tweets, we might end up with um, a more bigger network, like this one, for instance. And from this graph, to this network, we, we, we can actually point out the person of interest. The person of interest is actually the person most people are actually following or most people are actually choosing to. And those person are actually the key person. And in the society, we to say is from them that the revolution might come, for instance. Okay, for more richer, more richer data set, we might end up with something like that. It's actually a huge network with where any any web signal is actually a, 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 tweet, a Twitter user, for instance. And um, also, we might end up with uh, this kind of network as well. And using some in, in, in interesting library like Network X, we might actually deal with all those. Uh, all this graph and trying to do some kind of net research and unfortunately it's actually beyond the scope I'm actually preparing for you guys. And the third one that is an analysis. I'm just saying some analysis because it's actually a, a nice topic, but um, I'm not so specific in it. So that's uh, everything I got for you guys and very very thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you very much. So Rockefeller, um, I think you've already shared a PDF, but uh, the Python notebook would be great if you can share that um, as well, and I can distribute. Is that fine? Uh, uh, let me just provide something. You know, um, I can just uh, share uh, the PDF file of everything I've done so far with you guys, so that so, so that you guys might, I mean, uh, coming up with nice advice or also ask question. I mean, would be happy to do that. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm on the very early stage of my career in machine learning, so it's very much interesting to learn from you guys. Fantastic. Rockefeller, thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Okay. <laughs> you did a good job. Thank you. Okay, I think that concludes today's uh, meetup. Apologize for, or apologies for just a bit longer, but uh, I think it was very interesting stuff. Um, if you want to network and socialize a bit, I'm not sure if there's food left, but <laughs> maybe drinks, maybe wine. But uh, anyway, great. Thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it.
people loved your pretty face. Man. Yeah. Oh no, I this is my face.
really fast. It might be even come here well, but, but uh, I don't care about the equipment. It's a little bit here. But it's quite really coming. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll be ready. I'll be ready for my car. Yeah, I'm not even going to do it. 